Hello and welcome to the Global Church Project. I'm Graeme Hill. Johann Schreimer was born in the former Soviet Union. He became a believer as an adolescent. In his book, Liberty and Confinement, he tells of he struggled to be a Christian while serving in the Red Army in the former Soviet Union. This involved interrogations, beatings, and threats to his life. In 1986, Johann Schreimer founded the missions organisation Logos International, focused on reaching Eastern Europe. He's got a heart for church planting and reformation. He challenges the church to move from traditional to mission-focused community activities and structures. As a theologian and writer and counsellor and international speaker, he's written more than 20 books. Johann Schreimer, welcome to the Global Church Project. In your book, Liberty and Confinement, you talk about your struggle to be a Christian in the Red Army in the yeah. 1970s. Can you tell us something about that struggle and also how you found freedom? Yeah, well, in, having been a boxer, a sportsman, having been a, a part of the youth party elite, um, I, uh, I was... Uh, Already the Soviets trained me to be a, uh, a world changer, to change the world to a better place, to a communist place in their terminology. Mm -hmm. That was my biggest desire. So coming to the Soviet, uh, to, to that Soviet army experience and rejecting the military service because of my convictions, pacifistic convictions, I took out of the Bible. I believed that sometimes very naively but I did so at that time. And uh, uh, also because the Soviets were fighting the Chinese, at the, there was an unrest at the border. And, um, and seeing what you did, you know, becoming a Soviet soldier, you would uh, pledge to follow the party in every uh, direction the party went. You, you sold your soul, so your, your, your life, your heart to the, to the communists. Party and so I couldn't stand this, so I rejected the military service. Ended up in that place, and uh, there's one story which uh, I also tell in the book: the story of my teeth being cut out, uh, um, pushed out. Um, one day they got me in, and they knew, of course, I was a boxer. So they brought a small Muslim in. They said, "Well, Muslims are Christians are enemies." So uh, they, and they, they said to the Muslim, you have to hit out the fourth tooth on the left mm. side. Mm. And then of course, they st uh, and then they read the, the New Testament to me which in Matthew 5, 39, it says, if somebody hits you to your, your left cheek, you turn the guy your right. Mm. So he says, do you believe that stu stupid stuff? I say, well, sure I do, because it's the Bible, it's the New Testament. Well, we'll see how much you believe. And then this Muslim, small little guy, started to hit out my tooth. You know, good Soviet teeth. It mm. takes quite time to get it out. And um, after the fourth or fifth night, I started to hate that little man. You lose tooth after tooth and for nothing. And the only thing you do, you just hit back. And then you're free of the torture. But then you, of course, also say, I don't believe that text in Matthew 5.39. Mm. And, uh, and there was a huge unrest in me. Uh, the un unability, disability to, to, to love as Jesus did. And then one day, it was, uh, it was a, a green um, a Good Friday, and the night before Good Friday, they called me in, and they says, well, we have seen seen your, your faith, I'll kill you. We'll kill you, there is no other way for you to stay alive. But we give you one more opportunity to think about it. So you have a half a day free, you may go wherever you want to, in the compound of course, of that labor camp, and, uh, and then come back to us and tell us what your decision is. So I went to a, a corner, in that compound, deep grass, and started praying. And I asked the Lord to change my heart because of my hatred. And now being killed with hatred in your heart for a Christian, that's not a good option. So I <laughs> cried to the Lord, please, please fill my heart with love. Change me 
What, what's the problem? And then the Spirit of God fell on me. Now you're a Baptist, I'm a Baptist. We Baptists were not known for charismatic <laughs> experience. Not original, at least. <laughs> So, and I was not taught uh, any charismatic reality. Uh, I knew the Spirit of God as a, a dogmatic figure in the Bible, no more. So the Spirit of God fell on me with such an incredible might. I couldn't stand on my feet any longer. So I fell down and laying in the, in the grass, I felt a love of God filling my body. It was an incredible emotional experience. And the night coming, I was called in, and I looked at, uh, the, the officer looked at me and says, how did you decide? I said, well, I decided to follow Jesus. And then he comes to me, he's a huge guy, huge feast, and he wants to hit me, and his feast flies into my, my, my faith. And somewhere here, the feast stops. And then this guy started yelling at me, he says, why are you loving me? I don't particularly love the guy, but at least not emotionally, mm -hmm. but I was not hating him anymore. I was ready to die. And he couldn't hit me, so he let me go. It was a long story, yet you read the book so you know. At the end of the story, I almost lost my life. But um, that experience changed me totally. Um, to forgive enemies around you, to be an ambassador of peace has become a natural thing. It's not coming out of a, out of theology, out of a must, out of my confessional mm -hmm. statement. It, it's naturally there, because the spirit of God is a God of, um, is a is spirit of love, and He has, uh, He has entered me, mm -hmm. and it's it's now years and years and decades after. And I'm still living with it and almost feeling the moment. <laughs> what do you think are some things that the church in Eastern Europe can teach the Western church today? Um, well, there are a number of lessons. One lesson is um, in times of, uh, of uh, uh, political freedom, uh, we are there to strengthen our membership, and to spiritually strengthen our membership. Spirituality, mm -hmm. missional spirituality, becomes a ruling factor for whatever we do in the church. Mm -hmm. We are allowed to. We, we have the freedom. We have, our, uh, we have our opportunities. Now, in the Russian church, there was an incredible movement. Just imagine, 19, 1917, just prior to the revolution, we had 100,000 evangelical Christians in the country, in the whole Russian Empire, whole of Russian Empire. 1929, 10 million. So 100,000, 10 million. You talk church growth. It's an incredible growth. But churches, it was a difficult time. There was civil war, there was revolution, civil war. It was not an easy time, but it was also a time where the Soviets allowed Protestants being the, the uh, in their eyes, the enemy of the Orthodox Church to develop. We had the freedom of development. Instead of concentrating on spirituality, the churches concentrated on, on evangelism, on, on growing their churches and on the infrastructure. They even tried to build the city of the gospel in Siberia. A whole city. Yeah. Uh, and then Stalin came. And then persecution came. And the church disappeared. Disappeared. Where are the 10 millions left? Many, many of them were actually falling away. They were not strong enough. So we have to strengthen our churches. You know, really to, to live a life with Christ for, as Paul says, you know, I don't live any longer. I'm dead. Christ, Christ lives in me. And if I die tomorrow, what, what, what's the problem? That, that lesson the Western church needs to, to, to understand. The Eastern church didn't. Now... Of course, 
through all this sad experience, they have learned a lesson. I hope so. Most of them at least have. A second lesson. If you look at the Eastern Church and their experience in times of persecution, persecution is, has never really, after the church became a church, mm. and all those added membership and, and spontaneous membership disappeared. Yeah. The church be became a strong factor, and uh, that church has not diminished the numbers, still adding members. Persecution does not make us a lame duck. Persecution in a country, less freedom doesn't mean less movement. And a third lesson I think we have to, to learn. As soon as our countries open, we should live of what the Lord has created amongst us. And not mm. look at the attraction outside of, 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 the, of, the, of our own country. What happens to happen to the Soviet Church? We had an influx of Western uh, great theology, great missions, great ideas of an incredible size. We reckon of, of, uh, for about 50 billion dollars, US dollars, of help coming into the Baptist and Pentecostal churches. 1991 the Baptist Church of Russia had about 91,000 members, maybe 93 around this. Now, today, there are less than 70,000. There was no growth. What happened? They were running away. The Western people came in, and they were giving us the impression that heaven is in, in the U.S. Today, a city of Sacramento has more Russian churches than any other city in the world, including all cities of Russia. So instead of promoting mission and strengthening the church, the, the church was actually brought to migrate. And your own city, Sydney, mm -hmm. has more Russian believers than some of, of, of the Russian cities. The German, German, you have the mm. same reality in the West, in Western Europe. So instead of now accepting responsibility, it was so attracted by Western sponsors coming in, Western money coming in, Western way of living coming in, that this material well-being destroyed their missional spirituality mm. completely. And for the Western Church, this means don't believe a good sponsor makes good living. Don't believe a good budget makes a good church. It's not money, it's not the material well-being. It is a spiritual attitude, it's your spiritual health which determines your future. Otherwise we'll lose out. And then you look what happens to, to North America. George Barna, one of the most important uh, um, uh, Institutes of Statistics, Church Statistics, says the North American Evangelical Church has lost 15% of their members in the course of the last 10 years. Now this is, this is not including all the migrants coming in. Like churches like Willow mm. Creek or Saddleback, Saddleback I know the numbers, they have about 6,000 Russians among them. They didn't become Christians there. They migrated as Baptists, and they became a me members in a, another Baptist church. So church growth is uh, transferring the saints from one country to the other. And even then, with all the transfer of the saints, the numbers have dropped immensely, which means God is not with them. And that's a very sad thing to discover. We do, we try, we whatever we do, but the blessing of the Lord goes somewhere else. It stays then with the Chinese and uh, with the Indian and in, in Africa, and it's not here. And, but we still think because we've got enough money, we are especially blessed. Uh, money is mammon. Mammon doesn't go well with the Lord. Yeah. 
Johannes Rama, thank you for joining us at the Global Church Project. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. You've just watched an abridged version of this interview. For the full interview, plus resources for churches and colleges and universities, please visit www.theglobalchurchproject.com. I look forward to your company next time. From me, goodbye.